let's kick this off. And I wanted to kick it off because your project says quite a bit about what you all are doing. And so I wanted to start there with the mission of the Shadow Project. So please, somebody read the mission of the Shadow Project, would you please? The Shadow Project partners with special education teachers to help close the achievement gap separating children with learning disabilities from their peers. The only nonprofit of its kind in the country, the Shadow Project fills a critical gap in schools for an underserved population, helping teachers to engage at-risk students and transform classrooms into a place where children can become confident, courageous, and critical thinkers. Powerful words there, yes? hard work there yeah yeah and I was touched by uh, the becoming which reminded me of Carol Dweck's quote becoming is better than being right and so much of this work that we do within um, what I'll call that non-cognitive um, umbrella um, is complex and it is about becoming there is no landing place of being even within growth mindset you don't just identify yourself as having a growth mindset and that's it. There's a, actually a lot of work to maintain the ability to hold a growth mindset over a period of time. And you move back and forth between a growth mindset and fixed mindset all day long, right? All through your life. And so our time um, together, I wanted to start with an activity with Legos. I love Legos and Legos has a great new uh, focus on education and so they have learn to learn Legos and in those bags you each have a little kit hopefully everyone has their own I would like to start off by getting hands on with Legos so your directions are to build a duck wow where to begin with the uh, building of the duck I'm wondering um, from your perspective how did you approach the task? Throw out some ideas. How did you approach this task? Carefree. Carefree. Independently. Independently. <laughs> we ignored instruction. We ignored instruction. <laughs> Teamwork. We talked a lot. We talked a lot. What else? Teamwork. Teamwork. Strategy. Strategy. Assessing. I copy. Copy. <laughs> Copy the person sitting next to you. Because my duck had arms, and then I looked at Shara's, and she had used pieces that made it look more like wings, and so then I changed mine. <coughs> and did I give any instructions to say, hey, don't copy? No. No. No strategy. No strategy. Positive self talk. Positive self talk. <laughs> <laughs> now we're here, we're going off. Getting off to the racer. What else? Lots of laughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Creativity. Creativity. How did I set up the task? Gives bag. I gave you a bag of Legos, and I said, build a duck. Build a duck. Yeah. I didn't give you any more than that, did I? No. Now, how about think about this? If I would have said, oh, you half over here are really good duck builders, what would that impact then change for you all over here? If you knew that they were the, the duck builders, the expert duck builders, how would that make you feel? I'd be watching them. You'd be watching them? Yeah, they're good. I want to see what they're doing. They're, oh, say that again. If they're doing a good job, I want to see what they're doing. You want to see what they're doing. And that's an outcome of holding a growth mindset. Oh, I am holding it. When, you're, when you are curious about someone else's success and actually you want to learn from it, that's an outcome of a growth mindset. Yeah. If someone is threatened by what they're doing over here, success-wise, mm -hmm. then that's when we're holding our fixed mindsets. After all, someone else's success makes us feel uncomfortable. Because within a fixed mindset, remember, there's just that certain amount of, of intelligence, ability, or talent that we all have. So if they have a lot of it over there, then that must mean that we're vulnerable to not having much over here, right? What else? Well, the grid directions say with a partner, and you 
you said Hilda Duff. Yeah. And I'm looking at that, and I just, it was just such coincidence that we had to work as a team. <laughs> because, but we were, I think, I, we were relying on each other's strengths. Strengths, yeah. Come up, and we were collaborating. Yeah. And did it mean that each of you had to literally touch a Lego in order to, to be a part of a team? Yes. Or did someone, or was someone more verbal? We well, said stuff might be pretty cool. He said no. Oh, so you even had some things to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just went on, and then I just followed him. <laughs> so you gave up in terms of convincing him to come to your side, and you said, you know what? I'll let him build it up. <laughs> well, then we built it together, though. There's parts of all of us here. That's an interesting, right? The negotiation and compromise <laughs> that happens within teamwork, even over building a duck. Can everyone hold their ducks up? Here's another element. You all have the exact same materials, and I have not seen one that looks the exact same. So what if you're sitting on that side and you're so competitive, like I am? You want to build a better duck than the people who know how to build a duck. What kind of mindset? Did yeah, what kind of mindset? Point? Did you hear that question? She said that, what if you're over here, a part of that non-good builder group, and you're highly competitive, and you want to build a better duck than those over there, what mindset would that be? Well, so we don't believe we are bad, but bad duck builders. That, I think that's the difference between a room full of educators answering that question and our students answering that question. Because if you do that to me, I'm definitely going to try and out-duck out this okay. side. Uh -huh. But yeah. my students, they're not going to go to that side. They're going to be like, oh, this is useless. I give yeah. up. Put a couple people in there and put them to the side. Yeah, totally. Maybe Unless not you, all of them, but most of them. Uh, Unless you're presented in a way, well, these guys are supposed yeah. to be the best duck builders. But you know, somebody on this side could possibly be better than yeah. that. So it all depends on how you... Present. Present. Yes, and we're going to talk a lot about that um, as we move into goal setting um, and look how interact, how mindsets interact with goal orientation and how setting up tasks and activities can place students in more of a learning goal, which aligns more with growth mindset versus a performance goal mentality, which aligns more with fixed mindset. And so how you present tasks in our classrooms has a huge impact. Interesting that you bring up students. What if I said all the good teachers over here are going to be building the ducks and all the so-so well, teachers over here are going to be building those ducks? Interesting because we do it to ourselves within uh, teacher evaluation mm -hmm. and how we talk to each other about who's a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And when that teacher gets praised and labeled good teacher, amazing teacher, that then also contributes to the mindsets that are at play in that culture. So be thinking about that as well as we move forward, okay? Especially tis the season for goal setting with teachers, huh? <laughs> I'm an administrator, so I know I've got the next couple of weeks set up with several of my teachers around goal setting. And that's a challenge in terms of, of uh, the way we have it structured right now in our system to focus more on learning goals versus performance goals. Well, thank you for indulging in the, the duck activity. Um, be thinking about it as we kind of move through um, the, the content today. But I do want to um, extend it just a little bit with a book, Duck Rabbit. You know this book? called Duck Rabbit by Amy Krauss Rosenthal. And I'm going to read it to you because it's heavy with a lot of what we've been talking about. Hey, look, a duck. That's not a duck. That's a rabbit. Are you kidding me? It's totally a duck. It's for sure a rabbit. See, there's his bill. What are you talking about? Those are ears, silly. It's a duck, and he's about to eat a piece of bread. It's a rabbit, and he's about to eat a carrot. Wait, listen. Did you hear that? 
I heard duck sounds. Quack, quack. That's funny. I distinctly heard rabbit sounds. <laughs> now the duck is wading through the swamp. No, the rabbit is hiding in the grass. There, see, it's flying. Flying, it's hopping. Look, the duck is so hot, he's getting a drink. No, the rabbit is so hot, he's cooling off his ears. Here, look at the duck through my binoculars. Sorry, still a rabbit. Here, ducky duck. Here, you cute little rabbit. <laughs> oh, great. You scared him away. I didn't scare him away. You scared him away. You know, maybe you were right. Maybe it was a rabbit. Thing is, now I'm actually thinking it was a duck. Well, anyway, now what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Hey, look, an ant eater. <laughs> that's no ant eater. That's a brachiosaurus. The end. Great book for perspective taking, right? Great book to uh, demonstrate how we all bring a ton of background knowledge, experiences, questions, wonders to a certain activity like building a duck. And even with the same materials, you end up with something completely different than another person. Another reason I like sharing this book is because when you're talking about measuring constructs like motivation, like courage, like mindset, it's more about this than anything else compared to when you are measuring something like addition, subtraction, literacy development. You and I can walk into a classroom and observe a student and we can walk back out and I can say, do you think that student was motivated? And you, Jane, would be like, well, no, I don't actually think that student was motivated. And I would say, well, I do. And then we're off to the races and trying to determine whether that student was demonstrating motivation, right? We can walk into the same classroom. Jane, does that student know what 2 plus 2 equals? And you'd be like, yes, 2 plus 2, they said 4. Yeah, they demonstrated it, 4. And I said, yeah, I agree, 4. And we can agree on that. All the other constructs are very difficult to measure. Therefore, it's difficult to teach. And ultimately, when it's difficult to teach and measure, we tend to do what with it? Ignore it. Say that louder, please. Ignore it. Ignore it. Yeah. Ignore it. And uh, Carol Dweck recently wrote an article that I'm, you should all have a copy of um, that dives deeper into growth mindset. I love that she wrote this article just a couple weeks ago. It came out. Um, and she's revisiting growth mindset. And she's revisiting it because the translation into practice of mindset elements, the different principles and practices, um, are very, very complex. It's not simple. The idea of growth mindset is simple. The translation into practice, highly complex. And so she makes a couple of, of really great points that I want to highlight before we move on. Um, and if someone would please read the paragraph at the bottom that starts with the word recently. Someone asked what keeps me up at night. It's the second to the last paragraph. Would someone please read it aloud? Recently, someone asked what keeps me up at night. It's the fear that the mindset, it's the fear that the mindset concepts which grew up to counter the failed self-esteem movement will be used to perpetuate that movement. In other words, if you want to make students feel good, even if they're not learning, just praise their effort. Want to hide learning gaps from them? Just tell them everyone is smart. The growth mindset was intended to help close achievement gaps, not hide them. It is about telling the truth about a student's current achievement, and then, together, 
doing something about it, helping him or her become smarter. Thank you. She also goes on to say, I also fear that the mindset work is sometimes used to justify why some students aren't learning. Oh, he has a fixed mindset. We used it to blame the child's environment or ability. Must it always come back to finding a reason why some children just can't learn as opposed to finding a way to help them learn? Teachers who understand the growth mindset do everything in their power to unlock that learning. And she goes on with some other great points about it. And I very much see the work of, of the Shadow Project and what you're all doing is, is just that, right? Trying to unlock the learning for each individual student. And her emphasis on how it's being used um, is a very important part um, of the work in terms of reflecting now. Growth mindset has been popular last couple of years. Now we're to the stage where we need to really reflect and dig deeper into the learning. Um, and part of that is understanding our own mindsets, the adults, um, and how that then translates into environments with little ones. I just, you know, I read her book this summer, and yeah. she really went into a lot of detail about making sure we're not telling kids they're smart, but we're talking a lot about the praise effort. I, I've noticed how hard you are now. Yeah. Um, keep going. Yeah. So, and not the praise piece. And so, you read that paragraph and you hear it. It's kind of shocking because it goes against the very core of what you published. Yeah. So my question is, how did this deviate? Well, and what she makes a great point at the end is that um, my colleagues and I are taking a growth mindset stance toward our message to educators. Maybe we originally put too much emphasis on sheer effort. Maybe we made the development of a growth mi mindset sound too easy. Maybe we talked too much about people having one mi mindset or the other, rather than portraying people as mixtures. We are on a growth mindset journey too. And I know, um, and I'm sure you all have experienced it as well, I, I have the knack of putting working draft on the bottom of every single thing I've ever written because our thinking changes all the time, right, within 24 hours. That's what learning is. Learning is supposed to, it's a change process. You're not supposed to think about, and if you look the exact same in your class today as a teacher that you did five years ago, we've got some problems, problems. to solve, yeah. right? Um, and same with Carol Dweck, she wrote that book, you know, it came out in 2006, that's a long time ago. Um, and it, that book wasn't about the how yet, per se. It was about the what and the why. Now we're all digging into the how, and the how is extremely complex. Um, and that's why I appreciate this timing of it. It came out just in Ed Week a couple weeks ago, um, because now a lot of folks have gone you know, past this introduction phase of growth mindset, and now are really getting into the how. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's funny, though, that you, you said 2006 was a long time ago. But that is, a, is an element of a societal growth mindset. Because yeah. nine years, 30 years ago, would not have been a long time ago yeah. in research. Like yeah. People wrote something in the 40s that stayed around for 30, 40, 50 years. It wasn't yeah. old at all. And so like now we're entering this time where, like because of all this technology and influx, I'm more willing to give up a thought I used to have than I think my ancestors were, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I don't know where that all fits in. No, like, that's a great observation. Yeah, I appreciate the observation. Because I think that has meaning for how we then teach and how young students learn, right? Um, which we could dig deeper into that and spend a whole nother couple hours just within that concept, right? Does that then, need to change how we teach if we are able to sort of um, reflect on what we were doing yesterday, pivot really quickly based on that and go, hmm, no, that didn't work out so great yesterday. I need to change that now. And being able to do that in such a way there is fluidity to it, there's meaning to it, there's relevance to it, that's a challenge, isn't it? Thanks for bringing that up. Any other thoughts around? Yes. Oh, with, with yeah, I, my mind keeps going to standardized testing. Yeah. Because we're saying all this and then April comes. Yeah. 
and I have sixth graders who see F every Friday. Yeah. So we can work on gross mindset, and then, um, but we have systems in place that do the opposite. Yeah. They counter this in a big fat mark or number. Yeah. That has huge impact. Yeah. And you, um, you can. That's okay. Do you want to walk? No, you can walk. I'm okay. Stand here. I'll come stand over the corner. <laughs> <laughs> can we both stand over here? Nice. <laughs> um, no, the uh, the conflict between um, trying to teach a growth mindset, promote a growth mindset within a fixed mindset system is is huge. That alone can be very stressful, can it not? Yeah. And at times calls for even a, a more sort of persistent, purposeful passion-filled work, right? But Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, back to this time thing, I think there'll be um, I think the evolution of this understanding I think is sort of shaking up some of that. Um, I know here within Oregon, which I'll get to some context here um, for Oregon, um, the standards and what we look at. And so we can circle back around to, to your point in terms of that, those systems and those policies and practices that really keep you from um, moving forward with uh, growth mindset teaching and learning in such a way that really realizes all of its benefits. Right. So, but you mentioned the whole system of fixed mindset, this idea of smart balance assessments or you know, state assessments, whatever we want to look at, the big picture, and we have struggling learners, and we can't just say, oh, they're in a fixed mindset, because there's a lot of other environmental and developmental issues that are getting in the way of their accessing education. So, and just say, oh, they're not, you know, they're not trying hard enough, isn't going to cut it. So even you know with my own kids, we will have that conversation with. Okay, yeah, trying hard isn't the issue. It's we have to figure out a new strategy that's going to be that's going to get there. But then if we look at the whole system and we want to change that, that's where I think it's a whole. How do we change the system? Yeah. Uh, and it can't just come from one teacher, but that that whole part. Mm -hmm. So as you know, she was talking about that's. I think that's what comes to mind right now yeah. in that part. Yeah. And that's a hard place to be as an educator in that middle ground to where you have your day-to-day um, -day work um, that you have to navigate in such a way that is um, productive and positive as much as can be, right? right? And then you have this bigger picture and you are part of the bigger picture in your daily work and so what impacts the bigger picture, right? Um, and that's a billion dollar question that I have no, I will not stand here and act like I have any answers to. I'm definitely not coming as an expert with some answers. I'm coming as a learner just like you, just trying to figure this all out um, and to make sense of it all, right? Um, the questions that we'll move through is, I'm just going to touch briefly on what is growth mindset and social emotional learning. I pair growth mindset with social emotional learning and I'll explain why when we get to that. And then we're going to get in just a little bit to the why. I know you all have had a training on mindset, so we're not going to hang out there too much. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the how, moving through three principles and practices. And those principles and practices are support elements of goal setting. OK? Sound like a plan? So what do we already know about growth mindset? And what do we already know about social and emotional learning? Throw out some words, some phrases, some concepts. When I say growth mindset, what do you think about? Potential. Potential. Unleashing, unleashing potential. Whatever. Unleashing potential. Thank you. How people view failure. How people view failure. Thank you. Perseverance. Perseverance. Sure. I, I have not heard that my growth mindset yet. Was that a seminar that public schools did? Not that I know of. Oh, some, raise your hand if you have been in a training before with, uh, around growth mindset. Okay, so just about half. Okay, so mindset then for some is a new concept. Great. Yes. Thank you yes. for letting me know. So that's what we'll spend a little bit in the uh, explicit about what is it. And thanks, Sharon, for bringing that up.
Okay, unleash and then how you view uh, failure and mistakes. What else? Perseverance. Those of you who have interacted with mindset, what else comes to your mind? Also, learning from your mistakes. Learning from your mistakes. Resilience. Resilience, thank you. Honoring the process. The process, yeah. Process is huge. The value of practice. Value of practice, thank you. And feedback tied to that practice. Feedback tied to that practice. Honest yeah. feedback. Honest feedback. Um, I used to work in a school that used a program called You Can Do It, and they had these five keys of success. Yeah. And I don't know if it was um, like consciously related to the growth mindset, but I'm seeing a really big link there, and the keys were resilience, organization, confidence, persistence, and getting along. Yeah. Do you know it? I do know it. I'm familiar with it, yeah. So some more elements as well. And that then crosses over with social-emotional learning. Yeah. So with social-emotional learning, what comes to your mind? Getting along with others, building relationships, yeah. Perspective. perspective taking, thank you. Perspective taking, empathy, that's that social awareness, competency in SEL. Learning to be successful. Learning what it means to be successful, yeah. Learning to learn skills even, right? Which is what these Legos, the learn to learn curriculum, this is to teach learning to learn skills. Self-regulation, Self thank you. Impulse control, yep. And that can all fall under self-management, the SEL competency of self-management. Mm -hmm. Adapting, adaptability, yep. You said something over here? Oh, self-awareness. Self thank you. Asking questions and learning from others. Asking questions, learning from others. That resourcefulness element, thank you. Thank How about back here, any thoughts? SEL, social emotional learning, any thoughts back here? No? Not yet? Not yet. Okay, not yet. Let it soak into the brain. Okay. And then we'll come back to you. Yes? Any thoughts back here? Perseverance, yep. Any thoughts back here? Not that has already been mentioned. Not that has already been mentioned. Thank you. Maybe like cooperation. Cooperation. Negotiation. Kind of negotiation thank you. Listening. Right. So quite a bit. And here's what's interesting is we don't intentionally uh, spend much time on these elements on SEL growth mindset in a regular school day, unless you, as a teacher, deliberately and intentionally steal some time basically is how you feel right if you are spending any time on SEL or growth mindset do you feel like you're stealing time from the another part of the day raise your hand if you feel like you're stealing time and and doing something kind of quote unquote sneaky right <laughs> you laugh so yeah <laughs> that must be the feeling right it's true it is true um, and so the context for Oregon there is some um, sort of uh, exciting news around what's happening in Oregon with our standards. Um, the P20 continuum, that's our vision for Oregon, right? The P stands for prenatal, 20 is grade 20, graduate school. And it's about this continuum from prenatal all the way up to graduate school. And when you look at our standards across the world, this is zero to five. So we have in Oregon standards, early learning standards. They have five domains. Common core, two domains. Cognitive development for math and then language and literacy. And then for college and career readiness, there are four domains. Interesting that a lot of these domains align with early learning. Go figure. So we really have a lot of work to do here, right, even with standards. And as you know, standards alignment work is huge because after all, a lot of times standards drive what we teach, right? And so what's coming soon for kindergarten in Oregon are standards in approaches to learning and social emotional development. So standards for kindergarten are coming soon here. In terms of Oregon's context for that work, it falls within that pre-K-3 alignment work. Um, but that alone um, 
as you know, these little moves are what cause uh, things to shift, right? And back to changing a whole system. This is the kind of stuff that causes things to shift, tipping points, right? Um, and the more that K-12 grabs a hold of social-emotional learning, mindset, learning to learn, all that other non-cognitive, the better. And then that ends up, hopefully, impacting the system at a, at a greater level, right? Um, kindergarten assessment already measures the two domains of approaches to learning and social-emotional development. Every kindergarten teacher in Oregon completes what is called a child behavior rating scale and that measures. So already we're now using tools that measure these domains. And approaches to learning I use um, as the what for a growth mindset. Growth mindset is the how, like how do you develop an individual's approach to learning? Well, you develop it through growth mindset, teaching and learning. Question. Has there been any work done? I know they've only done the approaches to learning for a couple of years. Yeah. Looking at the validity and reliability of that instrument? Um, a lot of the reliability and validity came prior to the, them adding it as part of the assessment. And now they have started to do all the analysis around the reliability and validity of it within the kindergarten assessment. Um, Approaches yes. to learning? Yeah, yes. the child behavior rating scale. Mm -hmm. So last year the teachers filled it out almost before the first day of school. This year we got them and they filled it out in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Kindergarten. The kindergarten mm -hmm. students. For all kindergarten. Yeah. And it's a six. Um, so it's designed to be, um, it's observation based, so, you know, observe for the first four weeks and then complete it. Um, it's an interesting you know, process in terms of um, ad adopting a kindergarten assessment. That's new for Oregon, only the last couple of years. So there's learning to be had there in terms of uh, back to growth mindset, learning something and reflecting on what you've learned and then learning from mistakes, right? <laughs> in terms of what went well, what didn't. Question, are the early learning standards um, state standards? Not like a national kind of like core. Um, good question. The um, Oregon's early learning standards are the Head Start okay. Child Development Early Learning Framework, which most states adopt as their pre-K standards. Okay. Um, some states tweak it a little bit, but the five domains um, that they're designed around are the five domains of child development, are the five domains of school readiness. You can't get around that. Um, so it's just uh, states sometimes customize it a little bit to make it their own, add a few, do some rewording, that kind of thing. Good question. Thanks. So are they using the social emotional uh, scale to, uh, to put teachers better with, with the range of where students are, emotional, social emotional, or is basically for purposes of how to tweak? Yes, yes. So where students are going to become more discomfort, have experience more discomfort, yeah. and, 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 and readiness, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I, how it's being used right now is really um, as a baseline tool. Um, right now they're reflecting on how to then use it as a formative, meaning how then do teachers use it to inform and guide assessment, or instruction, I mean. Um, and that's a process that um, will take a little bit of time. Um, and already they're, they're tweaking this part of it, not just this child behavior brain scale, but the whole kindergarten assessment based on the pilots and based on the rollout and all of that. So now it's a matter of reflecting on how it's gone, what has been learned, and, and adjusting from there. All right, so what is mindset explicitly? What is it? It is a belief, right? It's our beliefs about our intelligence, our beliefs about our abilities, our personality even, our skills. And when you're holding, and I use the word holding purposely, when you're holding a fixed mindset, you believe that all of those elements are fixed. They cannot be changed. If you're born a math person, you're born a math person and you will always be a math person. You'll be good in math because you were born that way. 
Along the continuum is a mixed mindset, where you're really holding both of the mindsets, even at the same time, really. And then on this other end is a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is the belief that intelligence, abilities, skills, talents are malleable. You can change them. And the reason I use the word holding is because it's all temporary, right? I don't think it's possible, now if someone's experienced it, please let me know, but I don't think it's possible to go through a full day holding a growth mindset. And the reason I say that is because it is a challenge to always be in that space for not only yourself, but for others around you. It, it seems like it's going back to the whole nature versus nurture long ages and ages ago. Yeah. And tell me more about that in terms of the... In, in terms of what makes a person, is it things that you're born with, your belief that intelligence, abilities, and talents are fixed, versus the experiences in your life, how they are yeah. valuable. Yeah. yeah. And a lot about it's the and versus either or and the and, right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and within mindset, mindset by no means throws out the genetics part of who we are. Um, it, it probably more looks at the and than anything. But thanks for bringing that up because that often is sort of like, is that what was being said with mindset? That, you know, it's that nature versus nurture and um, all of that. But now we're learning, it takes quite a bit. It's not just the belief alone that changes everything, right? It's the outcomes that come with the belief that have the greatest impact on that change, right? So what are the outcomes? Oh, first let me share this quote because I love it so much. So many times you get asked, do people with a growth mindset then believe that anybody can be anything like Einstein? And the answer is absolutely not. When you're holding a growth mindset, it's not about you believing anybody can be Einstein or Michael Jordan or whomever, but it is about the belief that an individual's potential and true potential is unknown and unknowable, which in education, we really like to know an individual's potential and we even give them labels to help us know that potential but it's unknown and unknowable. I don't know your potential, Melanie. You don't know mine, right? Any of the students in my class, I do not know their potential. Question, comment. Oh, it's just making me think of critical race theory yeah. and how that plays into this. Yeah. Because how we view our potential is very complicated. Yeah. So there's all these other issues. You know. Yeah. It's all a big onion, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, the layers and layers that you start peeling back um, can be daunting when you start peeling all the layers back and, and try to make sense of how it all connects and relates and, and all of that. Amanda? Um, I've been having a lot of thoughts, but when you said, like, I'm, I might not be a math person or I am a math person, I think sometimes it goes into preference. So. You know, finding things that our kids are really excited about, too. Because, like, for me, um, I might not be super into Legos, but I will still, like, try. Yeah. Or, like, I've always wanted to sew, but I don't prefer it. I find it yeah. boring. Um, but I know I could have the potential yeah. to, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think, like, thinking about that, preferences, when teaching, growth mindset, mm -hmm. starting off that, and then kind of maybe going to the things that aren't preferred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then asking the next question, where do our preferences come from? Our strengths. Probably our strengths. But I think that, like, um, you know, sewing, like, I think I might have a great vision of what I would want to sew, but the actual act might be <laughs> just, like, boring, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So um, even if you're good at something, you might still find it boring. Yeah. You know, so. If you're bad at something, you might find it exciting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
So back to the onion thing, <laughs> the onion metaphor. I mean, you can really peel back every, which I, th I think at the core of, no pun intended there, but at the core of reflective practice is peeling it back, right? A certain concept and peeling those layers back to better understand it. But yeah, you often, I think about it within little ones when they start playing um, sports um, and when they say, or playing an instrument, right? And, oh, I don't want to play that anymore. You wonder what happened. You know, was it because they weren't feeling like they were good at it yet? So therefore, they don't want to continue. And then does that become a preference because they were good at it for that sport or that playing of that instrument? or that learn uh, a craft like sewing, you know, like how does that all play out? And at one point do you continue to nurture that persistence versus, yes, let them go and find a, find a new preference or develop a new preference and interest, right? But I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, all of this is oversimplifying. And I'm going to play the devil's advocate because it's bringing up a lot of things for me. Oh, okay, the sport issue, for example. Um, can I be a doctor? Uh, do I see myself as a neurosurgeon? What is society showing me? Yes, me, a white female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see myself out there. Mm -hmm. But do my students, children of color, see themselves out there? Yeah. Do my students who live in poverty see themselves in those positions? No. no. You go to Kaiser and you'll have a hard time finding a doctor of color. Yeah. You go to your school and you'll look around and you'll see faces like mine, predominantly. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like we can talk about it at this level, but we're oversimplifying it. That in our world, our society, in the United States, other countries, there is institutionalized racism Mm -hmm. that affects the core of all our children, yes. whether they're white, black, or brown. Yeah. And I feel like that these discussions and these theories, to me, oversimplify the society we live in. Yeah. So. And I think that's back to the uh, translation into practice is where the complexity lies, right? Because we can have all these theories and all this research and that's what, you know, I think Carol was trying to sort of put out there again is that the translation into practice is what is so complex and dynamic and not simple at all. This what, we're still in the what, is simple, right? There's two beliefs. There's a mixed belief and you can hold one and sometimes you can hold the other. But how that all translates into practice, as you're mentioning, very, very complex. It is complex because we're not going to change the makeup of our the staff in our schools overnight. No. We're not going to change the fact that um, to receive an education costs whatever, $80,000, and that uh, if you look at, you know, companies and who run them and who hold the power, you know, it is, we're not going to change all that. So I feel like a lot of these series just keep bringing it down to a personal level, and our change has got to be, of course, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that we don't have the responsibility as educators, mm -hmm. and that for the well-being of all the children we teach, our mindset should be mm -hmm. like this. But I'm saying we can't oversimplify it. Right. And I think that's what we do, is we fixate on theories that are, mm -hmm. are great. Mm -hmm. They're great theories, but we have administrations whose actions don't reflect the mm -hmm. theories that we're trying to enact. Exactly. So, yeah. Sorry, I got on the soapbox. No, I'm glad that you're you're bringing this up because this is where what I was mentioning earlier in terms of where we're at with different theories mm -hmm. and research. It all becomes very popular, right? Becomes very popular. But the work is actually hasn't even started yet. And everyone can have the posters up, you know, embrace struggle, um, a mistake is evidence that you're trying. Everyone can have all those up from Pinterest. But that means very little. And I don't mean to like, you know, shut down Pinterest and, and criticize people who use Pinterest. I'm not saying that. But that's simple, 
right? Put up a bulletin board with growth mindset language. It's like but Abbott the, put pictures of colleges on your walls in your school and everyone's going to go to college. Yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> that I just feel like we're spending money and time on these oversimplifications. Yeah. I do think, though, that there is a starting place for all of us and we each have a different starting place. And so for an individual who grabs a hold of that Pinterest bulletin board, that might be their starting place. And I think it's important that I respect that starting place for them. They may not be along the journey at a deeper level yet, but that's okay. They're starting somewhere with the content, you know? Um, and I think that's important too. Same with right with our students. Like they need to start somewhere with a given content or skill. Um, but yeah, the complexity of it um, is something that will last a lifetime of studying. And, and, and really, how do you change um, mindsets? Yeah, I'm all jumbled now, but I kind of hear the last two comments relating to one another. And I almost hear you having a fixed mindset about something you're so passionate about, but I get why. But even though the obstacles are there, I want to have just using these terms, but I want to have a growth mindset about it because if if you don't, with all this evidence that you to have, if you don't have a growth mindset, so much passion, then we're screwed. So here's another oversimplification. So a comment now puts a fixed mindset. Whereas, as you say, in a given day, mindset is flexible, is fluid. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I'll here, get on my soapbox again. No, so no, like, but here, and this is, this is what, what I'll bring us back to what um, Carol uh, mentions in here. Um, some of you might have already seen it. Um, it's not about banning the fixed mindset. If we ban the fixed mindset, we will surely create false growth mindsets. That's on the, the mm -hmm. back page there, right? So if we automatically say, oh, holding a fixed mindset is a negative, I think that gets us in trouble, right? And it's that holding, that holding. I really want to emphasize that holding because holding means that it's going to go away <laughs> a little bit, right? Um, and so the, it's not that fixed mindset is, is such a, a bad thing. We need to better understand our fixed mindsets and what are our fixed mindset triggers? And what are those things that cause us to be in a growth mindset or in a fixed mindset, right? I think maybe telling someone they have a fixed mindset will automatically make the person feel like they're, you know, yeah. doing something wrong. Um, and uh, just like, you know, saying, just if you say that, then, it'll, then maybe someone will yeah. end up being that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so I think self fulfilling you say to our prophecy. kids, yeah. you're having a fixed mindset, they're immediately going to be like, oh my god, I'm doing something yeah. wrong. So yeah. um, I think as adults, it might be the same way. Yeah. Because we all want to strive to keep changing and keep learning. Yeah. So. And it's back again, it's not about the labels. You know, this got very, um, why she wrote this article is because she was discovering that there were, people were being labeled a fixed mindset or labeled a growth mindset. And labels are actually falling down that fixed mindset slope when you start labeling. And that's why I, again, use that word hold. I don't say have. I don't have a growth mindset. Right now I'm holding a growth mindset. Or right now I'm holding a fixed mindset about this. And being able to better understand when you're holding a fixed mindset, why you are. And then being aware of this alternative and to have that self-talk to be able to move along the continuum. Very, I'm glad we're getting deep into this. I love this stuff when it happens like this. This is, this is really where the unearthing of it all happens, right? I just want to piggyback on what she said uh, about the system versus the individual and uh, bring it down to the special ed uh, world, mm -hmm. whereas like, the mindset of full inclusion, it's all wonderful in theory, mm -hmm. but in practice we need more uh, support for the gen ed teachers to have these fully included students with, mm -hmm. that's just where it's at, I'm struggling with that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>
No, I, I can empathize with you. I understand that perspective in terms of. Um, it's like, where are all the perils? Yeah. <laughs> right. And even within special education, the how it intersects with mindsets, um, the labeling alone. You know, an IEP. Um, yeah, your student. I remember that, right? It was always Kendra. Can you come get your student, please? Um, was it? Raise your hand if you can't, or you're over that, right? <laughs> Can you come and get your student, please? Or I had um, my uh, first year out at Canby School District, and um, all of my, my students um, made the honor roll. And I um, taught students who qualified under emotional disturbance. And they all made the honor roll because they were working hard, and I had a different grading system. And they went down to the honor roll breakfast as sixth graders, and it was sixth, seventh, and eighth graders I had together, but the sixth graders went down. Principal calls down. Kendra, your sixth graders are down here at the honor roll breakfast. What, do, what are they up to? <laughs> <laughs> they're there with an instructional assistant. I say they're attending the honor roll breakfast. Silence. Hello? Oh. Okay, they're, they made honor roll? They did. Oh, okay. And I walked down. And that alone tells you a lot, doesn't it? And the mindsets that are at play there. Like either A, you end up surprised by someone's performance because you didn't think something that you knew their potential, so you try to figure out their potential and they um, didn't follow along with your ideas of them, right? Or B, did they make a mistake? Like, why is Kendra sending them down? Like, and all worried that they, you know, these seven sixth graders on IEPs for emotional disturbance were going to, what, cause trouble? <laughs> right? That's what it really was. It was like, they're, you know, yeah, they're, and you know what? I, I, ironically, you all know, how did they handle themselves? They're the best Great. <laughs> yep. Because after all, they were receiving a lot of instruction in social emotional learning all day long, right? So they actually had a lot of skills to be in that environment. Um, and Sorry for about, the word walk there. When I think about this conversation, I think about growth mindset. I also think a lot about choices and how to, like we're making choices all the time. And some of us have limited choices because of oppression and because of you know yeah. systemic racism and classism and all of that. Yeah. We're still always making choices, and I don't think that we can tell us, I think that this is about helping students foster, like, what am I going to do when yeah. I'm faced with these yeah. things that are out of my control? Yeah. How, what choices am I going to make in my limited or maybe unlimited parameters? Like, yeah. I think that that's where I go with it instead of, I don't want to think um, with this idea that, oh, I know what's coming up for you. I know, yeah. Yeah. I know the struggles you're going to have because I really don't and, yeah. and I don't want to put that on my kids. Yeah. That's another kind of good Yeah, no, thank you. Or that um, I had a student like so-and-so before. You know, when we make that statement, that's our fixed mindsets coming out, right? Oh, I've had a kid like this. I know, I know what's up with this, you know. We tend to, to do that um, really readily, easily. Christy. Just to piggyback on your comment, it, to me, the whole growth mindset is really about navigating your way through school, navigating the obstacles, knowing that the kids are not going to take that straight course, but they have the confidence and they're developing the perseverance and the, and the courage. They are going to encounter more obstacles because of poverty, systemic racism, what, whatever the circumstances are. And what do you do when you uh, trying to open and read a book and it might as well be in a completely different language to them? What do you do? What are your strategies when you encounter, when you deal with an obstacle and it's beyond your control? How do you navigate your way through? Who do you, who are your allies? Who do you go through? And how do you avoid giving up? And that the route they're going to take is going to be more circuitous, um, but that they have the belief that going off on these different tangents is really, they're going to be encountering adventures and seeing things that other kids might not. Mm -hmm. Um, the outcomes, 
of a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Um, take a look at both of these on your own there. Even how I have these laid out in two boxes is like this category thing, right? But a second that you place a student um, who would be maybe fall under this, this fixed mindset area in a given day, think about the context, think about the situation that they're in. You give them a different context, a different situation, and you'll see growth mindset in action, right? So yeah, it's not fair by any means to start labeling students as having a growth mindset or a fixed mindset, by any means. And school, let's not kid ourselves, the way school is designed tends to show a lot of this, tends to breed a lot of this because of the way it's designed. Back to the system, right? So again, it's not the student that is holding a fixed mindset because they're this individual entity and they aren't being impacted by everything around them. Their environment sends the messages that then they will be holding a fixed mindset in. If their environment sends messages, growth mindset messages, they will be holding a growth mindset message or a growth mindset belief, right? And that's where our power then comes in. You can create spaces where students and adults hold more of a growth mindset because of that culture that is being developed. And that's where the how, that's the how, that's where it gets really, really complicated. This one is always fascinating to me, are threatened by others' success, are inspired by the success of others. Us adults, we struggle with that all the time. Back to what I was talking about earlier when the teachers get the accolades, oh, that's a great teacher, she's an amazing teacher, he is phenomenal when we start describing teachers that way. What messages are we sending? That there's a such thing as a innate phenomenal teacher versus a teacher who has some phenomenal skills that they've developed. There's a difference there, right? It's almost, it almost likens back to, uh, remember the, uh, the people first language? Um, right? Took a while, right? I still know there's some hang-ups there, but right? In terms of, of people first. So a student with a disability, a student with autism, right? Also that here, a teacher with some effective, highly effective teaching skills. Different than great teacher. Do you hear that? Do you see the difference? Huge difference, right? And we fall into this trap all the time. Good student, great student, versus a student who has effective learning habits, learning skills that they've developed and learned over a period of time, right? So we have to also be careful of how we even talk to each other about our colleagues within a culture and changing. Do we speak of colleagues as being a bad teacher <laughs> hey, honesty's great. Honesty is good. Someone who's ready to be high. Yeah. Yeah, we do the euphemism. What's the thank you? What's the euphemism? What do we say instead? Oh, someone who's ready to retire. Yes, someone who is ready to retire is the euphemism for quote unquote bad teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And we even do that within the practice of peer-to-peer -peer observation. Here's how we can get ourselves going down a fixed mindset path really quick. Um, I would like you to go observe Sharon in her class. She has um, been able to provide instruction in such a way that um, all of her students um, met benchmark last year Ooh, and, that'd be awesome. <laughs> and I would like you to go observe her. What's at play there for the person who's going to observe her? Yeah. My my kids aren't cutting the mustard. I'm still trying over here. She has it all figured out and she's the good teacher. And so I'm going in and already I'm either here or here, right? Either I'm threatened by her success or 
if I'm holding a growth mindset, I want to learn from her success. Like, Sharon, what are you doing in there? Share with me. What are you up to? Right? And we play that out all day long in our cultures. All day long. Any others that stood out? The, the big ones, I think, are... Go ahead. Um, I find it really challenging to work with students that give up easily, and it's hard for me to constantly be coaching in that way. Um, and it, I think seeing this as a matter of mindset and thinking of explicitly teaching growth mindset to those students yeah. might, you know, maybe make it so that I'm not having to do that daily coaching to just yeah. try. So yeah. that for me is like a real hope moving forward. Well, thanks for sharing that. Because, yeah, this appealing the back, right? Yeah. Understanding the why behind it. What is at play? Is it a psychological resource that's at play? And mindset would be one of those psychological resources at play, right? That we can't see, but, yeah, we know is there. Any other observations or noticings here? Greg, you had one. Yeah, well, the same thing in terms of perseverance and tenacity. But it's not also just like how many times you stumble and get back up again, but it's also looking at how can I do that differently next time? Or what are some new ways that I can approach this because this clearly isn't working. But having the attitude of I'm going to be successful, but also helping I think both the teacher and the student understand what does success look like. And because success can be very different, and, but when you frame it in that context of your success looks like this. How do you feel success is going to be? And helping them kind of approach it that way. Mm -hmm. um, like I, my kids know that I run marathons, and you know, so it's like I'm not going to have you guys run 26 miles. But getting the idea of like, okay, what could success look like if we were running? You know, would that be once around the track? Would that be walking around the track one time? Would it be? What What would that look like? So framing it in a way where they feel good about it, and you also know that they're doing the wrong path of it. Yeah. Thank you for that practical example. Any other thoughts around the outcome? Sure. The, you know, persevering, I mean, our, our kids are, that's our kids, give up easily. I mean, they have all their school life, they've had so much trouble. And they have learned to give up easily a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Not really, but a lot of kids do. And that's where my bonus books for the Shadow Star come in, you know? I mean, that's, yeah. oh, you're trying to smoke book. Yeah. You know, they get extra points for their bone, and that's what makes Shadow Star so great for us, I think, is that that does help that. Help them persevere, even if they don't really want to, they know that they have something at the end, and after a while they get to see that, if I do work hard, I can get it, and eventually that will become ingrained, hopefully. That's yeah. Goal. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I think this year I've seen a couple of kids, I mean, if you look at this, excuse me, if you look at this stuff, I can't even grab it. I mean, really, is this something that's really a tr precious, treasurable item? I mean, it's. Yes. I mean. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm like, no, It's a piece of plastic. But I have had a kid this year since he earned a pencil and eraser that he bought on his own. He carries it with him wherever he goes. Why? Because he has his very own mechanical pencil? don't think so. It's because, you know, based on the original story, I think he earned this thing based on his own perseverance. Yeah. And another kid who carries around like a little squishy that he's got, it means something to him more than just the little item. I mean, these are, these are you know, they're not that great. I, I mean, they're, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, they're great, but they're not that precious. Right. Is, is there something about the, the fact, behind it. Yeah. the meaning behind it that, wow, before I used to have low self-confidence, I tried to do this, I realized my own, like, I mean, they can't articulate that, maybe they can, but like, this kid can, and like, it means something to him because he earned it, like, he actually changed how he views his world, has more confidence and trust in himself, and now this, this little person mm -hmm. is, is a... A symbol of a, his potential. Yeah, yeah. And a powerful one, right? But the perseverance, this should really say persevere and pivot. I'll change that for next time. Right? Sometimes you need to know when to pivot. Because just blind persistence and perseverance doesn't, right? Sometimes there's a time to pivot and try a different learning strategy and a completely different strategy all, all around, right?
we're going to look at the, the why, but you can see the, the cycle here. You know, our beliefs impact our behaviors, behaviors impact our success, and then it circles right back around, right? Um, mindsets interact with equity and stereotype threat. Um, a great article, Mindsets and Equitable Education. Anyone read it? No? I do have some copies I'll share out. It's a great article that looks at um, growth mindset training and how it um, decreases stereotype threat. Um, because after all, your intelligence is not linked to your race, your ethnicity, your gender, socioeconomic status, right? And therefore, those who suffer under stereotype threat when they're receiving training in growth mindset, especially in a public forum, that information is very powerful because after all, it's based on neuroscience. Can't argue neuroscience too much, you know what I mean, in terms of what we're learning about it. Bullying, it interacts with bullying. Bullying is about judging, right? I'm better than you, that whole comparison. I need to point out to others that I'm better, better to, than you because I'm feeling insecure and vulnerable because I only have a certain amount of smartness and coolness and if you guys take any of that away from me, then I'm not cool anymore. You know, that's that fixed mindset how it plays out in, within bullying. Now, here's the, the exciting part. Little ones are not born believing that intelligence is fixed. This is where we all come in, in terms of the system, starting from the very little. Little ones demonstrate what I call growth mindset oriented behaviors. Do little ones hold a growth mindset? No. Adults develop mindsets, right? But they do demonstrate growth mindset oriented behaviors. You can see it across the board here, right? A lot of self-efficacy evidence here. I want to do it myself, autonomy, independence, asking questions. This little one would love to grow their brain smarter and stronger, right? And then what happens? They get to school. They, uh, they get to school. They get to school and they start hearing different messages, right? Different messages. A lot of research has been done looking at the impact. Um, we talked about the research around stereotype threat. And then there's also the, the study um, that led into Brainology, the program Brainology with Carol Dweck's um, program called Brainology. Um, her and a colleague, Lisa Blackwell, um, looked at seventh graders and math scores. And those seventh graders who um, were taught malleable intelligence through this, this program um, obviously improved their math grades over the two years compared to those um, who believe their intelligence was fixed. And then also within fourth and fifth, sixth graders, um, those who describe, subscribe to a, a theory of intelligence, the fixed mindset, were more likely to value the appearance of performing well over actually learning, which that tends to happen and leads into what we're going to be discussing around goal orientation. The bottom line, children who later develop a fixed mindset are at a significant disadvantage than those who are holding a growth mindset. Right? This is an interesting one around American kids in third grade. It says a lot about back to the system, right? Yeah, and we, I know the connection, the correlation between the testing years is always what gets me hung up with that third grade. Um, really quick, SEL and why I pair it with mindset. So SEL is the process of teaching skills in these five competency areas, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision making. There are five of them. And how they intersect with um, mindsets, well, it starts with self-awareness, doesn't it? Identifying, understanding one's strengths, beliefs. So in order to understand your beliefs about intelligence, there is a need for self-awareness. Self-efficacy and confidence also interplay with mindset. And self-management, self-motivation, and then setting and achieving goals falls under self-management within SEL. And so the ability to motivate oneself is highly interactive with mindset. And then social awareness, duck rabbit there, it, 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 the, the third competency, relationship skills. Children's books, obviously a great vehicle for cultivating mindset and SEL competencies. Um, do you all have a, like an SEL program? in your different schools that you explicitly teach? Not yet? Like Strong Star, St Strong Star and Mind Up? 
Second steps, yeah. Zones. Safe and caring schools would be another one. Mind up. Mind up. Superflex. Yeah. Are these five uh, things that you have aligned with the five domains of student readiness for kindergarten testing? The the five domains of school readiness. The these competencies align with approaches to learning and social emotional development. Two of the domains of school readiness. Yeah and responsible decision making. So why SEL? Students who receive SEL are more connected to teachers in school, more engaged in learning, more motivated, more confident. Variety of studies over the last several decades have found a significant impact on students when engaged in social emotional learning. And we're not going to hover around this. I just want to at least connect those two for, for you, the mindset and SEL because I have this formula going to help me frame out my work. That's really about growth mindset plus social emotional learning plus academic learning equals optimal learning and growth. And that's how um, when I move forward with the how, um, that formula shapes it. It's my theoretical framework I use. And so now we're getting into, well this, you'll love this one right here. But now we're getting into the how, okay? So, for the purposes of today, we're going to be looking at three of the principles and practices of mindset. Neuroscience, goal orientation, and then praise and feedback. And all of them will intersect with these four areas. When you're developing mindset and SEL competencies, you're moving through quite a large system, right? A system that is made up of adults, parents and educators, cultivating our mindsets and SEL competencies is huge. Could be the first step, actually. We tend to focus on students, but it's really ours that we need to focus on. And then skill development in students, which means that there's explicit and embedded work being done in these areas. And then there's the culture, and then the big beast systems, structures, and processes. These are the practices, the policies, the procedures, the protocols. This is the system. And this tends to be under here the system that still operates with a ton of fixed mindset practices, policies, and procedures. Well on the surface we're all promoting growth mindset. Now the work has to start, right? This, I call these iceberg schools. The schools that on, have the great posters up, but underneath a lot of fixed mindset practices happening that can sometimes create uh, conflicting messages, mixed messages to, to students and to adults. So this is really where the work starts. It's trying to close this gap between perception and reality, right? And it's not one of those overnight. It's not a a uh, trendy little thing that's going to be fixed just because it's popular. It really takes a, a, a huge movement, really. Um, and you all are a part of that work, right? We created the system. People create the system. So, I mean, I have to hold the belief that we can create a better system or else we wouldn't be here, right? We still wouldn't be in the game if we didn't think there was still hope to, to create a better system, right? All right, so neuroscience, before we get into our, an activity here. Mindset is based on the basics of neuroscience, malleable intelligence, right? This wasn't always something that we knew in neuroscience. After all, we didn't know and understand how the brain learned for a long time, right? Now we do. And we now know that the brain constantly is learning and growing new neurons and growing stronger neuron connections. And that knowledge alone actually impacts the development of a growth mindset. So explicitly teaching students that their brains grow is one of the first steps. And that it is foundational to it, mindset. And once you actually have that knowledge, then 
that's that self-talk again. It's like, no, I know my brain. I know I can get better at this. My brain literally grows when I struggle with this. I know that. And so how the brain works. I want you to read this to yourself. And in a partner, with a partner, I want you to teach this concept, these concepts, to your partner within a 30-second period. Okay? So get with a partner right now. Partner A, you are going to be the teacher. Partner B, you are the student. You're the learner. And you are going to, partner A, teach the learner how the brain works in 60 seconds. Okay? Using whatever you have with you at the table. Um, so teaching little ones this concept, really first step, right? And I know some <laughs> talk about creativity using the materials there um, to teach this concept. Anyone want to share out really quick about what they use? Yeah, I was going to say, the couple of them had the, uh, the fidgets out. Can you explain how you uh, actually use that? Well, I kind of just grabbed it and started talking a little bit. <laughs> talked about how the brain is made up of nerve cells. They connect like this. It's electronic chemical. They develop new cells. New cells new come out here, new come up here, and then when it said, found something interesting or something that stimulated, I'm like, oh, oh, oh this is exciting. <laughs> or, you know, oh, oh, this is exciting. So, <laughs> that's called Monday morning lesson, right? Monday morning. Or end of Friday. <laughs> or end of Friday. <laughs> My partner, Dale, had Hi. a really great visual of a before when the brain starting and the after. It was very visual. It had some concrete tangibles. And, oh, I like it. It was a great little difference. Yeah. He was building with uh, electrical and chemical processing, wow. stimulation, and how the brain connects all the information with the before and after. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like it. So, Dale, hold up the before brain. This is the before brain. This is the after brain. Yes. Before the learning happens and after the learning happens. Nice. I like that one. Yeah. All right. Who else? Who else has got a, a way to uh, teach the concept of malleable intelligence? We just use Legos. We're kind of showing how, um, I was showing Eve how this was her brain and how you know, when she tried new things, she was, you know, adding new, new connections, um, building new cells, and then I was, I was trying to show how the cells connected, so then Eve took a Lego, and she was connecting the cells. It was kind of a, a mutual process here, so. Oh, another creative way of showing <laughs> this. I love it. So Legos, we've got Legos to use. We've got our little fidgets. You all have Legos in your spaces, yes? So when you think Monday morning practical, build in a little mini lesson on teaching how the brain works, how it grows, right? Fidgets, Legos, right? What else can we use? Anybody use anything different? Oh, the putty. Yes, the putty and how the malleability of the putty, Play-Doh, clay, that kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. So already you're getting some uh, ideas for how to actually teach this stuff, right? Thank you for uh, engaging in that activity, you all, with the neuroscience. Um, I do want to get right into our second um, principle in practice, which are goals, focusing on learning goals in place of performance goals. And we're going to do a di little activity. You all have in front of you a piece of paper worth circles on it, right? And now, be, keep, be keeping in your mind that when you're moving through this activity, the basics of neuroscience are still there, right? So these principles and practices aren't in isolation of each other. They very much support one, if not all, at the same time, right? So be thinking about that. So. There are two types of goals that have um, been studied over many decades, right? It's called goal orientation. There are performance goals and learning goals. 
And performance goals are based on an individual's desire to gain positive judgment, positive judgment of their performance. The outcome is really this, to prove their ability. Examples would be a test score, a grade, right? Those are some of those stereotypical classic examples of a performance goal. And then there are learning goals. And it's based on an individual's desire to increase their knowledge and skills. And learning goals are all about improving ability, not proving your ability. Where else do we have performance goals? IEPs. Thank you for that connection. Yeah. Sports. Teacher evaluation often hangs out over here. Learning goals, so you could have measurable learning goals. Sure. School evaluations. How we measure schools. How we measure schools. Yeah, fall over here, right? And so, can you also tell if you're holding a growth mindset in a moment, which goal do you tend to focus on when you're holding a growth mindset? Your learning goals, yeah. And if you're holding a fixed mindset, which goals do you tend to focus on? Performance, yeah. And then be thinking back to those outcomes. Remember the behavioral outcomes of a fixed and a growth? And so your task right now is to turn the blank circles on the piece of paper into recognizable objects and to engage your creativity. So you have time right now with your piece of paper and a pencil or a marker, whatever you have, to turn those circles into recognizable objects. <laughs> Not necessarily all of them. Engage your creativity, have fun with it, and now turn your paper over. And I'd like you to turn as many of the blank circles as possible into recognizable objects in one minute. Go. Okay, put your pencils, pens down please. <laughs> okay, so how did the uh, the first experience feel? Fun. Good. Yeah. Okay, good, creative, fun. Any other options? Relaxed. Relaxed. Yeah, easy going, right? Felt good. Well, I wasn't too sure how long we had. So I a little anxious, a little anxious <laughs> about the time because you didn't, you weren't sure about the time. Okay. How about task two? Pressure. Stress, pressure. Trying to get them all done in the time. Trying to get them all done in the time given. I knew there was more out there. That you knew there was more out there. You knew you had more to show, but you couldn't figure out how to show what you knew and. I like the first one because I felt like I could, I wanted to be really detailed with each one and put a lot of thought into each one and then the second time I got more done but they were like not as interesting or things that I wanted. It was just like production. Yeah, production. Back to that performance. So your, uh, your quality went down. Yeah. I enjoyed the second one because I thought it was broken down into smaller parts so I just had to think about this one and then the next time I only had to think about that one. So for me it was less intimidating. The second one was less intimidating. Yeah. Yes, we had a set amount of time. I, think, I mean, that's why everybody's different. Yeah, right? Everybody is different, right? And what does this tell you about setting up different activities and tasks? When you set up different activities and tasks with your students? You engage different kids. Say that again? You engage different kids and different activities. Yeah. Yeah. You engage different kids, different activities. And you work or, or different, different strengths and different weaknesses. Different so. strengths, different weaknesses, yep. Or engaging them in different instructions for the same activity. Yep, yeah. different instructions. And you probably gave us the same amount of time for the first one as the second one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so exercise their brains differently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's the same. And here's where you can see how you can, again, back to the malleability of our mindsets, by how you present different tasks you can place a student or someone else in more of a performance sort of feeling versus a learning feeling. 
And did you notice I used the words, word pause? Remember I said, let's just pause right here, sort of leaving it open that maybe we'll be able to come back to it, because maybe you have more to add to it. And so being um, cognizant of the words we use and then the messages that are sent out, right, is very important to the teaching of, of mindset and how sometimes we don't even realize that we send a fixed mindset message because it can be so nuanced, even how we set up different tasks and what we say. So here's a question for you. How was the way the task was presented impacted how you approached it? You know, did you approach it with more of a performance goal in mind, or was it more for learning? I saw it as more of a learning opportunity, and I didn't really care about your time because I have to spend a time on my IEP. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't cared about the fluency, so I wanted to have fun. That's great. So I would spend time on my IEP. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Any other thoughts about the, the setting up of the task? To me, it wasn't so much, and I'm still stro struggling to understand this performance and learning, but <coughs> quality. When the, there was the time, first one, the quality was, you know, the second time was just trying to get it done fast, not worry so yeah. much about the quality of what yeah. I was doing. Yeah. The quality definitely changes between yeah. the two, right? Yeah. And same with um, on the, when an individual is holding more of a performance goal, their quality is not their aim. Just getting, it Just getting it done is their aim, really. And some interesting us, here's some uh, signs that a student may, I want to emphasize may, may have, right? <laughs> A performance goal orientation. So signs that a student may have a performance goal orientation cheat copy from a classmate's papers or uses shortcuts to get finished. Seeks attention for good performance. Only works hard on graded assignments. That's a common one, right? Is upset by and hides papers with low grades. That's another common. How about that locker with all the papers in it? Boy. Lockers, if only lockers could talk. Or the back of the desk that are just crinkled all up in there. Compares grades with classmates. Chooses tasks that are most likely to result in positive evaluations. Is uncomfortable with assignments that have unclear evaluation criteria and repeatedly checks with the teacher. Now these are just signs that a student may have Right? We also have to be very careful that we're not then putting students in the categories again, right? Question. Yeah, well, not really question, Colin. That's what I was going to say. Just that first one, cheat copy from classmates' papers. I have often more seen that with my kids, not so much they, they don't know what to do. Yeah. I mean, or they're unsure. So yeah. it's not so much the performance goal orientation. Yeah. It's, that's a strategy because they can't do it themselves. Yeah which then may be a strategy to prove their ability because they're worried that you might not think that they have any abilities, right? I mean, if they're copying to get it done, they're still focused on this performance. Otherwise, they would say, oh, I don't need to do this at all. Wouldn't they? Yeah, maybe. But you know what I mean? I can't do it, so I can copy. Yeah, I can't do it, and yeah. I know that I need to turn something in. Right, yeah. Um, or I want, I mean, or I want to do it. I've seen more, I'm just, you know, maybe specific kids, I do want to do a good job. I do yeah. kind of have the learning goal, but I don't have a clue of what you're yeah. asking me to do. So my friend here yeah. does understand. So, so I'm going to yeah. at least copy from them. Versus ask and say what you just said. I want right. to be able to learn this. I don't know how to do it yet. Right. But I've kind of, yeah. Right? And then it comes into then helping develop language that, um, for growth mindset around student language. Like, I don't know how to do it yet. Mm -hmm. Yet is a powerful word in, within this. Thanks, Colleen. Oh, Please. I just, last year, I noticed our second grade were doing an awful lot of math as fluency tests. Uh -huh. A lot of frequent fluency tests just of facts. Yeah. And what I was seeing with a couple of my kids is they were showing accuracy and increased growth in their accuracy with me. Mm -hmm. But the classroom data was not reflecting that. And I think it was what you're saying, just that they 
their goal was get as many done as possible because that's what looked good. That's yeah. what made you look like your peers. Yeah. Um, and luckily this year, one of the teachers in particular was like, I'm not doing those things yeah. again because um, it was obvious that it wasn't giving really the data she was looking for right. was math facts, not how fast you do things. Right. But for, I don't know how they got onto it, someone suggested it. Mm -hmm. But it was a frequent, almost two-week fluency thing they were doing for a while. Yeah. And uh, it was definitely more aimed on performance than, than anything the task else. Yeah. The knowledge. Yeah. Thanks, Helen, for sharing that practical example. And that's a real one in terms of a common one, mm -hmm. right? Any other thoughts or comments around goal orientation? A student who doesn't accept corrections or criticism well, would they be on that the goal, having trouble with performance goal? Um, well, I appreciate how you're even asking that question, because that's a, one of those inquiry type questions. They could, right? And a lot of this is um, information to help us better understand students, right? It's not to necessarily back to these categories, place them in categories, but to really help us say, hmm, could they be more focused on performance than, yeah, the process? And so I appreciate you even framing it out that way. Because um, it it's coming from a place of, yeah, more information to better understand um, the students I work with, right? And that's what this all is, is information to better understand the students we work with and how then can we work with them in effective ways to support their, their growth, right? Their learning and growth. So yeah, this isn't about like, oh, if you, know, you see a student doing this, it's not about, oh, see, they're focused on performance goals. It's not about that. It's about giving you information to help you then ask some inquiry questions um, to learn more about students. So I have a question up. I'd like us to uh, name some of the, uh, the skills, the knowledge, the attitudes, the habits that are needed to effectively engage in goal setting. And I'm going to write some of them up here. Or, Quinn, you want to write some of them up there? Or does anyone feel like writing? Knowing your own strengths. Knowing your own strengths. So self-awareness, knowing your own strengths. Also knowing what's your weaknesses, knowing your weaknesses, or knowing areas that are going to be hard. So it's been a great hardship. Knowing your challenge, yeah, knowing what's going to challenge you. Thanks, sorry. Knowing your Thanks, Lori. What else? To effectively engage in goal setting, what what do we need to know how to do? Know how to access. Know how to access. Help. Yeah, assistance. Know when you know, know when you need it, right? Yeah. Sure. No. <laughs> Chrissy, know what a goal is. Know what a goal is. Yeah. What else? The ability to like break a task down into like multiple steps. The ability to break a task down into multiple steps. Yeah. Understand what is. Uh, Reasonable, but a or what, yeah. what is a realistic goal? Yeah, understand what is uh, realistic. Yeah. Um, like, I want to be an NBA basketball person. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you might want to be. It could be a goal, but, you know, yeah. just start earlier. Start, start earlier. High yeah. school. Or I want to play basketball in high school. Yeah, sort of um, understanding the, the, the realistic nature of goals. Well, I always think these kids usually feel a sense of worthiness. Yeah. You know, before they can feel like they're going to, you know, um, they feel like they can move, they can, they can want something different. They yeah. Self-worth. Self yeah. yeah. So an understanding of self-worth. Thank you. They need to feel safe. Safe. They need to feel safe. Courageous, for sure. Thank you. 
Reflective. Reflective. Yeah. 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 what do you think? I came in late, so I'm sorry. I don't want to like repeat what somebody else is saying. Oh, that's okay. I believe that all of these things are. Okay. Tell me what a goal is. Really to break tasks down the steps. Can we think of any other? It's almost like you know the very first step of is actually getting them to buy into the idea of setting a goal. Even before that, almost. Yeah. And you see what I'm doing here? We're doing that peeling of the yeah. onion here with goal setting, right? Yeah. Peeling it back. Motivation. Motivation. Interest in making progress. Interest yeah. in yeah. making Bring progress. Yeah, buy into that idea. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. How do you get them to like, yeah, that? <laughs> right. They also have to see it, I think. See it. Yeah. So yeah. If, you, if they see it in the moment, uh -huh. then you can point to it. Yeah. So, you know, that's. Yeah, so see it and feel it. it you know? Yeah. Then even visualize it in the future. You know. Have examples, maybe. Examples so that they. Examples. Like, oh, that because most, like you said, most of them don't know what a goal is. So if no. Says, oh, I want to do this. Oh. And then you know, like. Yeah. Something. Yeah, we say goals, and they're gonna. Perhaps maybe think of a soccer goal. Yeah, they don't have experience. If they so have experiences, you know, they need experiences. Yeah, experiences. Or just life skill flexibility. Flexibility. Changing your goal. Changing your goal. <laughs> yeah, flexibility to change your goal. <clears throat> and then yeah. Make practice and starting small. And practice and starting things. small. Starting with interests and then moving into more. Yeah. Um, like the academic social realm. Yeah. Starting with interest, yeah. starting small, yeah. Is motivation up there? Is that the purpose of that is motivation? Yeah. Here's a few that I came up with which are similar. Um, I just did a kind of a, one of those brain dumps the other night. Here's an interesting one. Yeah. And then being able to divide up a a task or a concept or a process. In order to divide up a process, you have to have an understanding of a process, right? And so I was finding myself going around in kind of circles, like, well, in order to know how to do and understand this concept, need this over here, right? Cause and effect, meaning my effort causes me to move forward closer to meeting my goal, right? And then this concept of effort, whole to part, part to whole, when you are breaking something up into manageable steps, there is that part to whole, whole to part, understanding. Um, courage, time, there has to be this idea of future. Goals are about not right now, but the future. So that's a complex concept right there. Um, frustration, which you all were kind of talking about with the the navigating of the obstacles and whatnot. Organization, patience. I was thinking patience is a huge one. In order to reach a goal, you have to be highly patient, right? Because it doesn't come instantaneously, your goal. And so I invite you all in this next um, activity to partner up in their groups of twos or threes or even fours, whatever you're comfortable with. But I brought books that um, can be used to teach these different sort of elements of goal setting. And so within small groups, I'd like someone to read the book aloud and then spend some time brainstorming how to use the book to teach one of the elements of, a goal, of goal setting. And then we'll share out some of our ideas. So this is one of those where your, the purpose of doing this is Monday morning when you have those ideas around children's literature, how do I start teaching these elements of goal setting? How do I teach goal setting? Children's books, great grab, right? I would love to start hearing some of the ideas that you all sort of discussed and brainstormed using uh, children's literature. Obviously from our list, um, goal setting, Sounds great, 
But in practice, here we go with translating in practices, how do you actually do it? Right? How do you develop that skill? Um, us adults, like I said, we struggle with it. Setting goals for ourselves and taking action to, to reach those goals. So what were some of those uh, ideas that you sort of came up with from the children's book? Or what was some of that new thinking? I know there's some new thinking and new questions that the children's book helped sort of unearth. Please, Andrea. So our book was about kite flying. And we read it from beginning to end, but then decided that if we were going to use it for goal setting, we'd start at the end. It's a family that um, wants to build a dragon kite. And each family member has a role in the process that seems to be developmentally appropriate. Like the mom and dad are the ones doing the stick braces to start with, and then the youngest person is cutting the tail pieces, and, and it works its way up through the family. So we thought to teach about a goal, we'd want to show the end product first instead of saying, oh, we're going to make a kite, and because concepts of what a kite is could be very different. So we wanted to be real explicit and say, like, here's the, this is what we're going for. How is this family going to get to that point? Oh, yeah. I have thought of that. Makes sense, doesn't it? Reading it backwards. Right? Set the goal instead of building to a goal. Yeah. Well, backwards design, all of that. Make sure you know what your end product is or end result. Yeah. You work towards the goal. Yeah. That's a great that's a great point. Who else would like to yes. Thank you. We read how to teach a slug to read, and, and it was very explicit with numbered steps on what you would do to teach the slug um, to read. And our conversation was around that students will often set goals, I want to be a better reader, or I want to be uh, you know, better at math. And uh, so our uh, new idea was to have the students identify something that they'll and have them in, you know, dissect, well, how do you think you learned that? And instead start, instead of with a new goal, and how are you going to achieve that? Yeah. And then they, in turn, could possibly be um, identified as someone that could be supportive of another student that maybe has a similar need, mm -hmm. and they've already achieved it, mm -hmm. and then they could with a student and help a student achieve a goal. Mm -hmm. Robust lesson plan there. Did you write that all down? <laughs> <laughs> recorded. The, it's recorded, right? Because that, yeah, I mean, when you go back and do this, like, where do we start? Where do I start with, with teaching goal setting? The, these are the places where you start, right? It's all up here, right? You've got it all up here. <laughs> Thank you. Who else would like to share? And you don't necessarily have to share like what your your idea was, but even what sort of new thinking came about, or some new questions, some new wonderings. Like while reading this book, I had didn't really thought about this before in terms of goal setting, and it made me think about it in a different way. And then, therefore, helps me develop my ways to teach it, right? Well, I, we read the red hen, and um, I kind of had one idea, and he said something about, you know, because there was no, 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 what to do when people are opposing you or not helping you, and so uh, when you're working with kids on writing goals or whatever, how to not get it. Go ahead about what's going to happen when nobody wants to help you, or how are you going to persevere even though maybe yeah. people are not going to help you? Yeah. Which was interesting. I was a part of this conversation, which then we were heading off into um, the whole idea of helping. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, maybe if someone isn't helping, is it because they don't know how to help, or they've never been asked um, to to help? Mm -hmm. Right. So then we thought about that, which I've never, I've read that book many times, I've never thought of it that way. And then you had made the point about um, the idea of how many times you can read a book and just the discussion alone 
that we were having here was very powerful in terms of unearthing some of that those goal setting elements and how we would be approaching it differently back to the duck right like you all started out this session with a goal to build a duck you all ended up creating a completely different duck right using the same materials and so that that whole uh, process of goal setting fascinating do you see how sometimes um, the why I wanted to bring the children's books is sometimes when you are starting to, to teach something new um, and some of you have been teaching goal setting obviously for for a long time some of you are, may just be starting out one of the the hardest parts is just that first step and oftentimes I use a children's book I lean on them as my first step to teaching something right and then oftentimes it gives me more ideas um, once I have at least a tool that kind of gets me going, right? Um, now, for our third principle in practice, praise and feedback. We're going to not spend a lot of time on it because we're, we're limited time, but I do want to talk about the importance of process praise and feedback. And so as students are moving through goal setting and the experience of setting goals and designing out steps to take and engaging in those action steps to try to reach their goal, what type of feedback and praise are adults giving during that process to students? Okay? And so there are uh, two types of praise that we often talk about, um, person praise and process praise. I'm going to give you a, a handout here. Quinn's going to give you a handout here <laughs> with some examples. Um, person praise. It's feedback that implies a person possesses a fixed quality. You can see the patterns here, right? You have permanent traits, and I'm judging them. In contrast to you're a developing per person, and I'm interested in your development. And so process praise emphasizes the actions, the choices that the person is making versus any innate sort of quality that they may or may not have. And the connection to neuroscience is when I'm teaching this to little ones in terms of growth mindset practices and principles, I'm always bringing it back to their brain. So their choices and decisions that they make come from their prefrontal cortex. So remember how we emphasize neuroscience, the basics of neuroscience? So I emphasize that connection to little ones all the time, bringing it back to you're using your prefrontal cortex you used your prefrontal cortex to do that because choices and decisions are coming from that part of the brain. So what does it sound like? And I do want to share this one video with Christine Carter, the Greater Good Science Center, about praise, good conversation between her and a parent. The Greater Good Science Center presents Half Full, Social Science for Raising Happy Kids, a discussion series between Dr. Christine Carter and Kelly Corrigan. So Georgia uh, draws, has been drawing the same picture for about six months. She has perfected it. I mean, it has 100 distinct parts. <laughs> and every time she does it, people flip out. And they say, what an incredible flower. I think that's, that's a really great example of just how powerful praise is. So she's drawing this flower, so you, she gets the, you're such a great artist, yep. praise. But if I told her, hey, why don't you try drawing an apple or a bush or a tree? No way. No, she doesn't want to lose her special status as a good artist because that's the praise that she's getting and she knows how to get it. Let me tell you about this really fascinating study that has been replicated several times. Carol Dweck has The mindset been, lady. Yes, the mindset lady has been going into schools and uh, giving kids a simple test. And all the kids do pretty well on it. But then she divides them into groups. And some kids, she gives them one line of praise. All the kids, she's going to give one line of praise. Some kids, she praises their intellect. She says, You're so smart. You did great on this test. You must be really smart. Mm -hmm. um, which is very similar to the praise that you're, you know, Georgia right. you're getting. a good artist. You're a good artist. And the other kids, she said, You did really well on this. You must have tried really hard. Right. So what's really interesting about this is just in how incredibly powerful that one line was. So then she went back to the kids and she said, all right, you can do the same simple test or you can do a harder one, um, which you might learn from. 
And, and all the You're So Smart kids started sweating profusely and having panic attacks. And they took the simpler test. The majority of the You're So Smart kids... They kept drawing the flower. Right. So they kept speak. drawing the flower. But in one study, 90% of the effort-praised kids took the harder test, right. which is really a remarkable result. Right. Because it's not about the outcome for them. Right. That's exactly right. So it did, what we're saying here is not that you don't, you shouldn't praise your kids. Right. We're saying you need to praise them in a really specific way. So the effort praised kids, um, they reported having more fun on these tests, mm -hmm. even when they were, weren't doing as well. Right. They wanted to take problems home to practice. But you're so smart kids don't want to take it home and practice because they don't need to practice because they're so smart. Right. Right. Effort. And means... if they do have to practice, then that means maybe they're not so smart. Right. Well, and another thing that I think is really compelling is that the effort praised kids, they liked the harder problems better than the easier ones, which is so great because that's how you get better at something. You keep challenging right. yourself. Right. Right. So this simple study shows how profoundly praise influence, not just how well kids did, because... But what it feels like. Right, and what it feels like, and the fun that they were having. Who right. loved learning right. versus whose intellectual confidence was a little bit shaken, who got a little nervous, right. who started to not do as well right. on a simple test. Right, because it's your whole attitude about effort. Either effort is a threatening thing, because you shouldn't have to work so hard because you're so smart, right. or effort is the experience. Right. Effort is the joy. The joy is learning how to do something for the first time, trying hard, being challenged. Right, right. So praise is very powerful. I'm going to give out a little, uh, a few examples here. And what we're really aiming to understand is the message that what we say sends. Okay, so it's not so much what we're saying, but really understanding the message behind it. Okay, so here's an example. You learn that so quickly, you're so smart. What is the, that message? If what is a child it took here? you a long time, you'd be dumb. Say it louder. <laughs> if it took you a long time, you'd be dumb. Yeah. If I don't learn something quickly, I'm not smart, which is essentially what you said. Right. And so it's, the process praise, it's not about coming up with like a long list of examples that you then try to reiterate right, and use someone else's words, but it's really about understanding what you say, ultimately what is the message that the, the person that you're saying it to, what's that message that they're receiving? Because we all can give you a long list, and I did give some examples of um, process praise, like growth mindset praise and encouragement, um, and you can see how within the, the examples on the, the right side, how it really talks about what the message, what the child, what the, the student hears. Okay, so here's another one. Look at that drawing. Isn't he the next? Is he the next Picasso or what? What does a child hear when you say that? Yeah, and I shouldn't draw anything hard, right? or they'll see I'm no Picasso. So then we go back to challenges, right? The next time that child's presented with a challenge, are they gonna take that challenge on? They might have more fear around it. Another example, you're so brilliant, you got an A without even studying. What, what message do we send there? Yeah, better quit studying or they won't think I'm brilliant, right? And then here are some more uh, examples. Um, look, you didn't make any mistakes. That one is very popular in our classrooms, as if making mistakes is a bad thing, right? Look, you didn't make any mistakes. So what's the child hearing? It's not okay to make mistakes. It's not okay to make mistakes. You worked hard on that project, and it shows. Tell me about what you did. So this gets more into the process praise, because what does the child hear then? Working hard is a, a good thing, yeah. And then you're also adding a feedback invitation, right? Tell me about what you did, which even makes it more rich in terms of that conversation. How about that picture has so many beautiful colors? Tell me about them. A lot of times you're, oh, that's such beautiful work, right? Or that's so beautiful. This is another way that you can get after 
to where the message becomes about them making decisions and choices. Like they chose the colors and you want to hear about their choices on why they chose those colors. Your effort and practice are paying off. You've really improved. How does that feel? So not just the process praise here, but the next in terms of feedback, getting it into like a feedback loop, like a conversation. How does that feel? You're smart. You can do this. That's a famous one <laughs> within uh, parents when I work with families around homework. You know, at, at night, trying to get the homework done. You're smart. You can do this. What do, what do they hear then? What does the child or the student hear then? Yeah, if I can't do this, I'm not, yeah, I'm not doing it. I can tell you're becoming a better reader because you tried different strategies to read that word. Is there a strategy that works better for you? And so you're really starting to engage in conversation around the feedback. And then the last one there. I can see that you tried many different strategies to solve that problem. How do you know when one isn't working? And that, those are examples of a specific type of praise and feedback. So you're combining the two. Are you all familiar with process praise in terms of and precise praise, giving a certain type of praise and feedback? Have you done some work around that in your schools? Who has already sort of? Either, yeah, either. Just looking at praise and feedback in general and what sort of messages we send a little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, right? And so the question becomes, what percentage of process praise do we use? What percentage of person praise? And then how might we increase the use of process praise? And that's really the reflection around it. And not just process praise to be inauthentic about it, but really understanding, OK, if I say this, ultimately, what is the message I'm sending? Am I sending more of a growth mindset message? Am I sending more of a fixed mindset message? OK? So in terms of our wrap up, because I know that our time has come to a close, um, I do want you to engage in a little bit of reflection around these sort of prompts. As a result of my learning today, what will I start, what will I continue, and what will I stop? So what will I start doing, what will I continue doing, what will I stop?